Hey, thanks for listening to our podcast. If you want to listen live in the central Indiana area, you can hear us on 93.5 FM and 107.5 FM. Hi, Matt. Taylor? Taking, I'm taking cover, man. No, cover. never played a down, and this guy's <laughs> killing me. Oh, man, I got to say thank you. He made my day. I've been having a lot of great day. Um, oh, Matt, let me ask you a question. You surprised? <laughs> it was a bit of a lack of effort in everything. I mean, the defensive line got crushed. Oakland was good. You got to give Oakland credit. Um, were you surprised? I was really surprised. Yeah, I was really surprised. Um, I'm not going to go as far to say there was an effort there. I'm never going to question effort, but I was really surprised with just the, you know, there was so many uncharacteristic things that happened in that game that, uh, you know, the Colts under Frank Reich just haven't been about. And what I mean by that is, you know, you had turnovers in the red zone. You had drop passes, unfortunately, again. That kind of surfaced last year when T.Y. Hilton was injured. Uh, you had – um, some untimely penalties in that game. And, you know, just going into it, you had some momentum. You know, you're playing at home, and you got a really tough test the next week after that. You're going to be on prime time. The Raiders had dropped two in a row. Uh, they didn't look like they – you know, their season was kind of on the brink coming in. And give them credit because they kind of rallied and put a good game plan together. And I thought, you know, for the most part, you could I – I think it's fair to say the Colts did more to lose that game than the Raiders did to win, but that's the NFL. The margin for error is pretty low, and the Colts just did enough to, to lose that game, I thought. Yeah, they did, and I got to tell you, um, I got to tell you, I, I I just felt like, you know what, it did, this is weird, right? but it just felt like a game they were going to lose. I don't know why. I mean, I, I really don't know why. There was some guy, I remember coaching like, damn, we got to do something because this feels like a game we're going to lose. How big a deal is Darius Leonard defensively? Yeah, right now it looks like he's a really big deal because the Colts just have had a hard time stopping the run. And and it's I think if you ask Frank Reich, and I know he talked about this after the game, uh, for him that's probably the most disappointing thing about this, you know, four games, you know, the first quarter of the season being over is just the inability to consistently stop the run. I mean, right now the Colts are near the bottom of the league and, and – um, rushing yards allowed I think they're 25th overall in rushing and they're 31st in yards per carry allowed um, and it's weird because most of the same characters uh, are back from last year and last year they finished sixth um, so it's you know plus you added Justin Houston too in that category so I'm not sure if you know Jabal Sheard's absence the first three games uh, played into it I thought he played really well last week on a limited pitch count you know coming back for the first time uh, but, yeah, I mean, Darius Leonard's one of those guys that could just kind of, like, clean things up over the middle, um, whether it's, you know, covering those zone, you know, those seven or eight, you know, soft spots in the zone in the passing game, um, or just using his athleticism and his speed to kind of track guys down, uh, racking up double-digit tackles consistently. So, yeah, not having the maniac out there is – has, uh, I think, hurt the Colts, and um, we'll see if he can get back this week still in the concussion protocol. I thought Bobby Okariki has played well, uh, but certainly, you know, Darius Leonard's one of the best players in the NFL for a reason. Yeah, I agree, man. i tell you what, T.Y. Hilton showed himself to be a damn valuable player too, Matt. Yeah, I'm not sure what the deal is. You know, I don't know if it's just coincidence or what, but just as, whenever T.Y. is out, you know, the Colts have had a hard time winning, obviously. They're 0-5 without T.Y. Hilton lifetime. Uh, but more than that, it just seems like whenever T.Y. is out of the lineup, the drops come. Uh, I go back to that Week 5 game last year in New England. You know, Zach Paschal had a drop. Eric Ebron had a drop in that game. Uh, both of those, I think, you know, kind of hurt the Colts in terms of it, continuing drives. Paschal's ball will kind of fluttered up in the air, and it was returned for a touchdown. So I, I don't know what it is about, you know, T.Y. not playing just um, creates more drops and more, you know, uncharacteristic mistakes by this offense. He's just kind of a calming force out there. Plus, he's been great in the red zone so far this season, too. Um, you know, the Colts were good in that category again on Sunday, but just not having him out there uh, with Jacoby Brissett to have a, a you know, that, that – consistent target to go to and knowing where T.Y. is going to be on every single play, it certainly hurts the offense. Uh, when you look at the Colts moving forward, biggest thing you see, not defensively, because that's the biggest thing you see they need to do offensively. 
Um, you know, I think obviously the chunk plays is something they're going to continue to try and you know implement into this offense. I think they only have nine big plays uh, through four games in the passing game. So just trying to get more people involved down the field. And, you know, without T.Y. Hilton, you know, it's it's got to be Paris Campbell. It's got to be Deion Cain. Deion Cain, Dan's played a ton of snaps. And he's been in the game a lot in terms of the percentages, but he just hasn't been involved. Uh, I think five targets last Sunday, uh, no catches. He only had one catch against the Atlanta Falcons the week before. So I want to see more playmakers getting involved in this offense outside of T.Y. Hilton, even when he is healthy. I want to see Paris Campbell. I want to see just the, the, the dynamic traits about these guys come to fruition on the game field. Yeah, I do too. I mean, you mentioned Deion Kane. Somebody, the thing you gotta, The thing you got to do, is and this is the disappointment I have in Ebron that you know somebody's out next man up is great that doesn't mean you just you know play that means you got to really play well and that was my disappointment with Ebron everybody's going to drop passes but you know with Hilton out man you gotta everybody got to take up that slack you know what I mean I yeah, mean I do. It, you know yeah a hundred percent and you know you look at Jack Doyle not being in the lineup for most of last season, Eric Ebron played more. Well, Doyle's healthy again this year, so the snaps are going down for Ebron. So the chances are decreasing. So when there is that that you know uh, moment in the game where you need to make a play, you got to make it. And you know I think drops are subjective, but there's no doubt that Eric Ebron had at least a handful on Sunday. And they're drive killers. They they, they kill you as far as down a distance. Uh, if they're a drop on third down, then you have to punt. So, yeah, everybody has to step up without, you know, an elite playmaker on the field. And so I, I think that directly correlated to, uh, the, you know, the lack of production and the lack of consistency on offense on Sunday. Yeah, you know, you know, to your point, um, um, the idea that you, everybody doesn't have to make plays, but when you look at a guy like Paris Campbell, I'll give Paris Campbell credit. Like, games – all right, because I guess what I'm saying is because Ebron catches the ball, right? Um, and let's say he catches it. Doesn't mean that Campbell's going to fumble it, you know, the next play. But because he didn't catch it, now you got a guy struggling for extra yards. I don't know if that correlates or not, but you, you know what I'm saying. I mean, it, well, it, for sure. I mean, everything has a cause and effect. And yeah, I mean, uh, you go back to on, on that same drive. Uh, I think it was the same drive. The games kind of get blurry to me as far as possessions and stuff like that. That's where Jim Sorge is so good, by the way. After the game, like, I don't even know what the heck happened. You know, I just need like 10 minutes to kind of compose my thoughts. Jim Sorge after the game is like, we had the incompletions and the penalty and and this happened. I'm like, how do you remember all this stuff? Um, but yeah, I think, you know, I think it was the same drive where they had they had the drop, and then they had to kick the 57 yard field goal for, from Adam Vinatieri, and then that was no good. And then the Raiders get good field position, so everything has a cause and effect. That's why you have to make plays when they're there to be made. And uh, I think that's one of the things going forward as we embark on the next quarter of the season is just being more consistent uh, for all of these guys, just making plays, you know, not trying to do too much. Um, and I think that's where Zach Pascal comes into play. And that's why I like Zach Pascal so much because every single week, no matter what his role is, he fully embraces it. And so without T Y Hilton, yeah, I'll go out and catch four passes for 72 yards and average 18 yards per catch and make some really difficult catches. Um, he's just consistent. Uh, he brings it every day. I know that's kind of coach cliche announced, cliche but he's one of my favorite Colts because he just is the same guy um, every single week in terms of just embracing the role and then just doing the best of his ability uh, with what the whatever the role is that given Sunday yeah you know um, last thing before I'll, I'll let you go I, you go I wanted to ask you this because I don't want to act like I don't know anything but I don't know this so I got to ask you this it seemed like there were a ton of Raider fans in the stands. I remember last year it seemed like there were a lot of Cowboy fans in the stands. When you go on the road, uh, actually my, my daughter asked me this, Dad, when the Colts go on the road, are there a ton of Colts fans in the stands? I don't know the answer. It seems like there are. There are, and I've been really surprised by that, um, you know, both ways. Uh, it just seems like more and more people, I don't know if this is true or not, but it just, it's just the, the sense I get. More and more people are, are choosing to 
uh, take their vacation and use their discretionary dollars on going to NFL games. Uh, I mean, uh, I've, I've, you know, when I was a sideline guy, you know, for the last four or five years, I noticed that everywhere we went, there were Colts fans, and they had good seats too. Just like you know, Raiders fans travel to Indy, and they had good seats at Lucas Oil Stadium. Uh, you know, in Week One out in L.A. Obviously, it's L.A. You know, it's it's a it's a tourist attraction. It's a destination. A ton of Colts fans were out there, and when you know the Colts were making plays against the Chargers, they were coming back. It felt like a home game in terms of the the, the cheer and the crowd and the momentum of the game uh, in our headsets. And so it's hard to quantify, but I think more and more visiting teams traveling to opposing stadiums is becoming more common. Um, and yeah, you just look at, you know, you wouldn't think the Raiders would, would travel well to a week four game when they're one and two to Indianapolis of all places, but they do. So, you know, give people credit. And I just think more and more people are prioritizing sports in terms of their, you know, paid time off at work and how they try to spend their, you know, expendable cash. Hey, last thing, what are your thoughts going into the Chiefs game? Uh, you, it's going to be fun. Yeah. You know, it, Arrowheads, it's, it's a bonkers place. Uh, they get after it. Um, you know, first thing that comes to my mind is just trying to keep up. You know, the Chiefs have a blistering offense. I think they rank second in yards, uh, second in points. Some crazy stat I saw the other day, they've scored uh, twenty at least 26 points in 22 straight games. Um, it, it's just incredible the, the amount of efficiency they have on offense. And the craziest thing is, is they're doing it without, for the most part, Tyreek Hill. That's terrifying to me. That's terrifying to me that they're putting up that amount of points um, and they're moving the ball that well without him, uh, which just speaks to, you know, the amount of weapons they have elsewhere like Sammy Watkins and Travis Kelsey and, you know, Demarcus Robinson. So you're going to have to put up points. I think the Colts can because on the flip side going into this game, just like it was in the playoff matchup last year, the uh, Chiefs defense is not very good, although that did not, you know, pan itself out uh, against the Colts last year in Arrowhead in January. The Colts had a really hard time moving the ball against the Chiefs defense for whatever reason. They came to play that game. So I think on paper it should be a shootout, should be a great game, but you're going to have to put pressure on Mahomes somehow, some way. Colts have no sacks in the last two games, and Mahomes has only been sacked three times on the year. Yeah, man, that dude, he reminds me, you know, he reminds me of Steph Curry. He's like the Steph Curry of the NFL. He plays with that looseness, you know what I mean? That is so spot on. That is a that's an awesome analogy. I mean, the guy just he's so smooth. I mean, both guys are smooth, right? And what they do, uh, the release points, you know, with with Steph coming off a screen, just gets it off so quick. Same thing with Mahomes, man. He just needs a little bit of a window, and he can fit that ball in there. And you know, he's he's attempting throws, or I should say, he's completing throws that not a lot of guys are even attempting in the NFL. Uh, and he looks like, for my money, anyways, right now, he looks like he's on track for another. MVP season. I uh, appreciate you, man. Thanks. Hey, I've listened to you once again on my drive home. Like, I left. I'm not going to lie. I was one of those fans that left after the interception. <laughs> I'm not going to lie, Matt. But you had me on the ropes there once again thinking, all right, let me ask you this. Would you have onside kicked? Um, You know what? I At the time, I was thinking, I was just like everybody else. Like, you know, there's, there's got to be some other philosophy that I don't know about here as to why they're not onside kicking. Um, but it, it makes sense when you, again, when you, you're you driving on the way home and you think about it, you can't overload one side anymore in the NFL. You can't get a running start. Uh, the percentages are so low at recovering, uh, at recovering it. Plus, you had all three of your timeouts. So it made sense after I thought about it. Um, but the NFL on purpose is trying to fade the onside kick away. It's just not very successful anymore because of the rules changes. So with that in mind, I was completely on board after I thought about it with uh, with Frank Wright. You know, the one thing I disagreed with was the percentage. you got to try it, right? I mean, I, I but I will say this, and your defense is getting gassed. And Todd just said that, but I'm sitting here going, you got to hope to get one stop. The thing that I'm saying, you got to get a touchdown. So you know what? The odds are you're not getting the overwhelming odds are you're not getting it. So if you can gain thirty yards on the other end, if you can get a stop, that then at least by doing that you can you can throw one in the end zone. If you onside kick, they get it. Let's just say you stop them and they punt it. You're getting the ball in the best case scenario. You're getting it on the twenty five. Best case right. scenario, right? Yeah. 
you know, just playing devil's advocate, though, like it's it's somewhat deflating, though, if you don't recover the onside kick. They get good field position at, like, you know, their 45 or the 50-yard line and then three plays. I mean, it really all boiled down to just whether or not you can get a stop and prevent them from getting a first down because no matter where on the field, if they got a first down, the game is over. So the thinking is pin them deep, try to get them off the field. Then, you know, they're punting from the, you know, their – 15 yard line in terms of where the punter is set up you get good field position at around your 35 40 yard line you need 60 yards to go down the field um, you're out of timeouts at that point I mean I see what you're saying but it just all boiled down to can the Colts get off the field right. and force a third down and bottom line is they just didn't do yeah that. and and I, I you know what I'm saying is I agree with the non-onside kick I do I, I think Frank made the right choice because you got to get yeah. touchdowns Yep. I mean, yep. That's you, you. You you weren't going to get a field goal. Field goal maybe it's a little different. I'm not sure it is or it isn't. And I think I think like what they tried to do is they tried to pooch it, and you know, kind of a sky kick method yeah. where the the ball would land and it would roll along the turf in kind of a soft spot because they had their hands team in, so kick it behind a couple of layers of that return team and then just go down there and, you know, sprint and beat a guy and recover the ball. Uh, it just didn't play out like that. I, I think uh, Rigoberto Sanchez just mishit the ball. It didn't put it where he wanted it to. I agree. You know what was interesting? The kick before, Matt, they, they lined up with their hands team up. Mm-hmm. And, right. and Rigoberto kicked it out of the end zone. And I remember I was sitting there going, man, that's a lot of ground. Who was it, Davis back there? Yep, yep. That's a lot of ground for a guy to cover sideline to sideline. If you can kick one high enough, get a little bit of a running start. I thought about the previous possession, um, but what are you going to do? Uh, I, I'm not. I mean, look, desperate times. You got to take a swing. Whatever you think is best. Frank did. That's not why they lost the game. Clearly, and you got to get better. It's the bottom line. Indeed, so, yeah. I mean, Trevor Davis was a huge part of that game. The, the play you're talking about, I, I remember thinking that at the same time. It's like he probably covered 60 yards to catch that over his shoulder right there in that situation. Um, and plus he had a couple of big catches. He had the end around on a 60-yard run. And most people didn't even know who he was because he's been on the Raiders for two weeks after being traded for from the Packers. Right. Um, so, yeah, I mean – they they just came in more desperate. They wanted it more, and, you know, the they got it. to regroup. Yeah, they got to regroup, no yeah. doubt about it. Appreciate you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Matt. Great stuff.